This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. This is a debrief of the September December exam 2019 ACCA SBR Strategic Business Reporting. I'm not aiming to show you to get 100%. I'm trying to make sure that you know what to do to pass. So a lot of it is thinking about how we obtain the easy marks in this exam. Before you watch the debrief, download the exam from the ACCA website. Also, before you watch each part of the debrief, I'd recommend you do read the question and then do a plan as to what you think I'm going to say then watch the debrief. Question one is called Luploid or something like that. It's in three parts, so we're going to have a look at part A. Part A itself is in two parts. <coughs> Excuse me, and even the first part, in a sense, is in two parts because they want to know about the fair value of the factory site. And also why you shouldn't be using replacement cost, which is probably a big hint as to why you should be using the other method that they mentioned. So I guess we can all get one mark. IFRS 13 is one of the most important standards in the syllabus because it tells businesses, remember, how to measure fair value. And the key message about IFRS 13 is it's an exit price. So that means the price at which you would sell the asset. So essentially, Start by putting down a definition of fair value. I won't write it out now, but again, or not in full, but it's all about the price that would be received. Again, active market, orderly market, um, again, between active participants, etc. And in addition, it says that where you have a choice of valuations, IFRS 13 says that you should use the highest and best use. So in terms of this property, the current value would give a different value to what would happen if they actually converted it into residential. So the highest and best use is residential. That would cost a million in terms of demolition costs. So 24 million coming in, 1 million going out for demolition again, and that would give you 23 million. So very important, you've looked back at IFRS 13 and you could write that definition out fully on fair values. They ask about replacement cost. Replacement cost is principally used for specialised assets. So if you had something which was unique in a particular area, like a steel foundry, and there isn't a steel foundry next to you, then in that case, perhaps a better measure of fair value would be to look at replacement cost, but at the same time depreciating it. So that first part of the question, the very first part there, straightforward again, um, marks going for basic knowledge of IFRS 13. If you use the wrong fair value, and therefore you put that into the goodwill calculation, you will still get full marks on the goodwill. Requirement two, the two methods of translating goodwill, of sorry, of um, calculating goodwill. So very straightforward question. That can't go wrong, can it? Fair value versus proportionate goodwill. The cost of the investment is 90. NCI, 
If you use fair value, it's measured at fair value, which will be given in the question. And the question said 22. If you use proportionate goodwill, then it's a percentage of the net assets. This is an 80% subsidiary, so it's 20% of the net assets of that subsidiary. The net assets in the question were 65, but we've just posted a fair value adjustment of 23. But method mark if you've posted a different one. So 88 for fair value, 88 for proportionate. The minority interest or NCI would then be 20% of 88, 20% of 88, 17.6. So in terms of a final number for goodwill, we're looking at 24, 19.6. No need for any explanation for the goodwill. It just says calculate. And again, proportionate goodwill will always give you a smaller figure. This is the goodwill only on my share of the business. Full goodwill also includes the goodwill on the share of the business that belongs to the non-controlling interest. Requirement B. And requirement B is about impairment. It's not a place where I would aim to get full marks because the calculations can be very messy. However, it says discuss, so some very easy marks for explanations. So, in terms of your explanation, these are the words I'd like to see in your answer. Remember, impairment is often, as here, triggered by an impairment indicator. So if you see an impairment indicator in this scenario, then mention it. In terms of explaining the theory, remember that the assets have to be valued at the lower of the carrying amount and recoverable amount. And also that the assets will be grouped together in a little bundle, and that is a cash generating unit. A subsidiary would normally be seen as a cash generating unit because it generates independent streams of income. Also in terms of explanation, that when you actually calculate the loss in terms of the allocation of the loss, first of all, you write down assets that have been obviously impaired. So if the roof falls off the factory, that's obviously impaired, for example. Secondly, you allocate loss to goodwill And thirdly, the rest of the loss is allocated to any remaining fixed or non-current assets. So thirdly, to other non-current assets. And that's always messy because you might have some intangibles and you might have some PPE. But that easy things to say. Another thing to say that's quite easy is depending on the type of the goodwill that is, is happening, when you think about the impairment, if you're using full or fair value goodwill, in that case, the impairment is shared between the group and the NCI. And then if you're using proportionate goodwill, then all of the goodwill is all of the impairment is allocated to the group. So 100% again goes to the group. So in terms of calculations, in terms of words, we've probably got half the marks. In terms of the numbers, I'm not proposing to go through them in a huge amount of detail just to start off the calculation. You probably find it frustrating that when you read the model answer, 
They've done something very strange known as grossing up the goodwill if it's proportionate, which is correct and you're supposed to do it. And when you look at the answer, actually it doesn't seem to out affect the final answer either. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Again, not worth shedding blood over. But in theory, when we set up our performer again for the impairment, I'm just going to start this thing off. So we've got two types. So initially, when I'm trying to sort out this impairment, two types of goodwill, either measured at fair value or using proportionate. So we start with the value of the goodwill. If you're using fair value, I think we worked out that the goodwill in the first part of the question was um, 24. The net assets, again, were given, I think, somewhere in the question. It says that the net assets, again, at the date of the impairment were 106. That's 130. We're also told the recoverable amount. The recoverable amount was 100. So the impairment, again, is 30. If you're using proportionate goodwill, there's a lecture on this, by the way, in our materials, then you're actually supposed to gross it up. Why? Because they say you need to match like with like. If you've got 100% of net assets, 100% of recoverable amount, you ought to show 100% of goodwill. Well, sometimes life is very annoying. So in the first part of the question, we had goodwill of 19.6. You're supposed to gross it up. I think this was an 80% subsidiary. So if you're looking at the answer, again, that comes out as 24.5. The other figures are the same. So that's 130.5. The recoverable amount is the same. That's 100. So the loss comes out as 30.5. Using the method on the left, I won't write the figures up, but that goodwill impairment of 30 would first be allocated against the building that was damaged in the storm. That's four. Then all the goodwill would get written off. And then finally, they'd prorate the rest of the loss. On the right hand side, it's the same. But essentially, you gross the goodwill up at the start. And then later, you kind of prorate the loss at the end you'll see it in the answer and in fact in this one it doesn't seem to make any difference to the answer but just try and get the basic marks so don't stress too much um, about all the calculations in the answer but make sure you pick up these very easy marks again from the explanation requirement C is in two parts and very important that we go for easy marks. C1 is also in two parts. The first thing is talking about the how we would measure the consideration, which is the share consideration for the subsidiary. Remember, in a takeover, very important that you revise fair value. So in a takeover, again, you want the fair value of the shares that are being issued on the date of the takeover. So ultimately, they will debit the investment, credit share capital and share premium with the relevant value. That calculation is easy to process. There are 10 million shares of the subsidiary. I am buying 60%. I'm giving two for five. And the fair value, again, is $30, which I think gives you 72 million, two marks. Very straightforward. 
Then a very strange question saying, what about the cost of the share scheme? Is this part of the consideration? So again, in the answer, he's done some calculations, which I don't think I've seen those in a very long time, perhaps 30 years, and perhaps it will be 30 years till I see it again. So I'm not going to lose sleep about that. But I can still get something for the principal. I understand that we are obliged to repay the scheme. So that must have some kind of cost. So again, I think I can probably say, without getting into any detail, that actually, one of the things that I'm doing, part of the consideration is the obligation to replace the scheme. And presumably, like everything else, it must be measured at fair value. So if you're a prize winner, you can work through the numbers, obviously, in the question. If you're a regular person, I wouldn't be losing sleep there. The second part then asked us again about the share-based pay. It asked us again to have a discussion and to do a calculation. The key thing I want to focus on is the discussion. And when you explain share-based pay, you're looking for four sentences. Number one, you need to explain the reason why the scheme is equity or cash settled. In this case, it's equity settled because it's settled in shares. Secondly, the fact that the, if the, the um, expense must be spread over the vesting period. In that case, that's two years. Thirdly, the fair value of the shares at the grant date. Now, if I'd been answering that, I would have just ploughed in by saying the fair value of those shares, again, is $20, I think, because it says that's the fair value of the option. Again, the answer will say something slightly different. And finally, the number of options or shares or whatever expected to vest. And of course, that takes account of the people who might leave the scheme and so on. So the number of instruments expected to vest so how many of these shares will eventually be issued? In addition, the other thing that you must remember is that share-based pay, you do take account of vesting conditions like performance conditions, profit targets, um, attending work, personal performance targets. But for the calculation, you ignore any share price condition. So in the calculation, again, you ignore, again, any share price condition. That's because, again, somehow the share price volatility is built into the fair value of the option at the grant date by someone very clever who's calculated the fair value of the option or share. Maybe that's you if you've done advanced financial management. That's known as a market condition. So in our calculation, we do not take account of market conditions. So if you were halfway through the scheme, hypothetically, you'd write one half, then you'd estimate the number of shares to be issued, write down the fair value, again, um, to try and get the expense in the profit and loss. Very easy marks, of course, again, um, just remembering what the basic double entry is. Debit p &L, credit equity. You don't have to write debit and credit. So if your journals are a bit ropey, you can just say profit will go down 
and equity will go up. Question two, that's the question that's called stent. The ethics question for the second part. In the first part, you're asked for three separate requirements. So, sorry, two separate requirements for three issues. You have to explain the accounting and you also have to think about the impact on gearing. Now I'm going to set up a table on the screen. You wouldn't do answer this in a table. I'm just doing it to make sure I don't miss out any part of the answer. But just to make sure I maximize my marks. Even if you were in a muddle about gearing, everyone knows, don't they? That you are supposed to the directors want to understate gearing they don't like having too much debt in their balance sheet so when you have a situation where the directors are perhaps not behaving very well they're probably understating gearing the first issue was a cash advanced from budster so you've got cash from budster accounting knowledge is because of the fact that the, the companies have some common control, that's a related party transaction. So therefore, it needs to be disclosed. Remember, when you revise related party transactions, there are three disclosures. Number one, the ultimate controller of the business. Number two, remuneration. And number three, three material related party transactions. It's that third one that matters here. In addition, if someone gives me money, then, and at some stage, I've got to essentially either get, you know, it, it looks to me like it's the nature of a loan. So when I get money, that's a financial liability. Maximize your knowledge marks. Definition of a financial liability, obligation, contractual obligation to deliver cash. So if it is a financial liability and they haven't included it on the balance sheet, that's going to increase gearing. So knowledge, you want knowledge of IES 24 on related party transactions. And you want knowledge, again, in terms of definition of financial liability, IES 32. Many people in this exam have trouble because they don't put down their basic knowledge. The second scenario, once you've read it several times, you, you understand that it's like a convertible loan. It's a convertible preference share. It doesn't matter, it's exactly the same as a convertible loan. So convertible preference share, we know, is the thing where we have to use split accounting. So this means, of course, that it's partly liability and partly equity. There's partly a contractual obligation to deliver cash and that must be measured at fair value. No calculations here, but that's where you would actually work out, if you had to calculate it, you'd look at the contractual cash flows and discount them at the interest rate on a regular bond or regular preference share. Equity is the balancing figure, but remember, saying balancing figure is okay, but it's better to say it's a residual interest. All the time I'm demonstrating knowledge. So if the directors book this as equity and it's a liability, they're understating gearing. So if we correct it, gearing will go up. Finally, there's a deferred tax asset widely set 
So we often get questions about deferred tax assets, particularly with losses. So explain why it's a temporary difference. Remember, the loss is recognized now, the tax relief in the future, and of course, you could only recognize it if realistically in the future, they are going to make a profit. So if realistically, you reckon that profits will be made in the future, <coughs> again, so if profits are realistically expected, Look at this scenario. It says they're making losses at the moment. So probably in these questions, you end up saying you cannot recognize the deferred tax asset. Now that's harder to think about from a gearing perspective. But as a result, if you don't recognize that, you're not recognizing the asset and you're not recognizing the credit to the tax charge. So that means your tax charge would go up in the P&L. Therefore, <coughs> your profit would go down. And of course, if profit goes down, cumulative profits go down, and that means equity goes down. Debt hasn't changed. Equity is smaller, so finally at the end, gearing will increase. Requirement B is the ethics part. So I need to explain the ethical implications of what's happening. And also, I need to think about the actions that I should take as an accountant I'm not the chief accountant, but I've been told that jobs are at risk if I don't obey what the main directors are saying. So, actions for the accountant. You'll notice that at the start of the question, there are basically things that suggest that directors might manipulate the information. So you can see that there are incentives for breach of ethics. I'd say incentives for fraud. Remember, fraud is about fraudulent reporting, not presenting the information as it should be. And at the start of the question, it says, the company is in a mess again, so it says they have got losses. It says they've got debt covenants. And these kind of things, of course, would be an incentive for management, possibly to manipulate the information. Always remember to get a mark for referring to the ACCA Code of Ethics and Conduct. Think about relevant principles. I think this one, they might be doing things deliberately wrong, or they might not understand what the rules mean. So with the deferred tax, perhaps they just don't understand the rules. So either they are deliberately misstating the information or accidentally. So if they are deliberately misstating, then that takes you, doesn't it, to principles like integrity or possibly professional behavior. If you identify integrity, link it to the definition, straightforward business conduct. Or it could be that actually it's just a point of ignorance they're not very clear about what they should be doing. And that would link up, wouldn't it, with the principle of professional competence and due care. Remember, 
define and just explain, that means that they are not maintaining professional knowledge. The last sentence also says that jobs are at risk, including the accountant. So there's an implied threat there, isn't there? There are threats to the accountant's objectivity. You met those threats when you did your auditing studies, but they're the same. They apply to us in all our professional lives, not just as auditors. Self-interest, because I do not want to lose my job. Intimidation, because my boss does not want to lose his. Easy marks for action. So those charged with governance speak to, again, the independent non-executive directors. Legal advice. Last resort, of course, would be to resign. Also, a very easy little bit, you know, to say is that when this thing happens, you have to keep a record. So again, you need to, again, so you need to record, again, what's happening. So essentially, record or document, again, everything that's happened, just in case it's needed later, if there's a dispute or a disciplinary hearing. There's nine marks there, including two marks for applying to the scenario. So it's worth spending a fair bit of time on that. Maybe we can get six out of nine comfortably on the ethics. If you give it the time, apply the principles to the scenario. Question three is did you wire? The part A asks us three separate things, doesn't it? So A part one, and then A part two, which is in itself in two parts, but we'll talk about that in a second. A1 is talking about the shares that have been received as revenue for the three year license. So again, the shares received. So first of all, in the balance sheet, if I receive shares, how would they, they be recognized? So if I receive shares, then of course the shares will be a financial asset. And you know that financial assets, which are shares, are either classified as fair value through other comprehensive income if you're keeping them for the long term or possibly short term fair value through profit and loss. Easy to explain that. When we think about the valuation of those shares, you know that financial instruments again have to be measured at fair value. So you could have a stab at calculating some sort of figure because they've got an expert's valuation. That valuation again changes, of course, but loosely looking at the first valuation, you might say, well, perhaps it would be 7% of something in the range of four to five million. But of course, that doesn't take account of a couple of things. The first of all, of course, is that <clears throat> these shares are not listed. Also, that valuation, again, actually um, is for a controlling interest. And if you don't have a controlling interest, the shares are worth much less. So in, in practice, again, it would, of course, be lower. In addition, we also need to think about when we book them, essentially, again. Presumably, 
the license gives me revenue of three over three years. So therefore, somehow I need in revenue to think about booking that revenue again over the period of three years. So I think as well, the revenue again would be over three years. You might be saying, well, how would the double entry work? I should think it would be a terrible mess, but we don't need to explain that. As well as asking about the shares that have been received, in the second part, they ask us about the royalties that have been received. That's much more straightforward, I think, isn't it? Because presumably, it's a royalty of 5% of sales. So that just comes back to the standard accruals concept. So again, the accruals concept. So match the cost and the revenue. Um, in terms of that, presumably in the first year, so this is in the year 06, 5% of $1 million would therefore give you again the royalty expense again in the first, in, in the, sorry, the royalty income in that first year. How much do you write about IFRS 15 revenue recognition? Well, you certainly don't write out the five stage model. I think that would make him a bit cross because it's not so much about that side, is it? I guess in terms of all of this though, the key message is back up here. It's the fact that when we book the revenue, it should be measured at fair value. That's the key message we're trying to get across. Finally, he was asking for a bit of discussion about how that links in with the conceptual framework. And that's a very academic discussion for professors in universities, isn't it? The best you can do is stick down a couple of definitions, try and apply it. In fact, that discussion, I think, was only worth two marks. And again, you would only, um, you know, it would be open marking. So personally, um, I would have gone for something about explaining the definition of asset or maybe the definition of income. Can you apply it practically to the scenario? I think that would be extremely hard. As you look back at part A, I think the place where people go wrong is probably just, they see the word revenue, get too excited. Don't forget to explain the other side. Shares are a financial asset and they need to be measured somehow at fair value. Question three, part C, about the pension accounting. The first part was a current issue about which 99% of students would have known nothing. The point is it was three marks. So that still leaves you another 97. And it was a current issue then it's probably not going to be a current issue by the time you do this exam. I'm not going to write anything special down. It's simply that prior to this um, amendment, service cost and net interest cost was based on the assumptions at the start of the year. After the amendment, they said you need to take into account things that change in the year. So, that's what it was about. It's one of those places where probably it was a bit of common sense if you were doing accounts in practice. So part one would have been difficult and probably to get more than a couple of marks on part two would have been fairly difficult. But it did say what's the impact on the calculation of net interest and service cost. So I think even if you weren't sure what on earth he was going on about, we could probably still have a stab at the service cost just using the, the numbers that are there. Because presumably, 
you've got Jan to August and September to December. So on the service cost for eight months, you've got a service cost of nine. That's 72. For four months, you've got a service cost of six. That's 24. 96. That's got to be a mark. Previously, I think they would have booked 12 months at nine, which quite frankly is a bit silly. The net interest cost, well, that's a bit messier and maybe there's a couple of marks here. Jan to August, September to December. Jan to August is eight months or eight twelfths. September to December is four months or four twelfths. Remember, you have to look at the interest rate at the start of the period. At the start of Jan, it was 3%. And at the start of September, it was 3.5%. You also have to look at the liability at the start of the period. At the start of Jan, it was 30. At the start of September, it was 36. So I think the revised net interest cost, if you multiply that through, you can do that later, it's not a problem. 0 0.6, 0 0.42, 1.02. What would they have done before? Well, it would seem that companies might have just used the assumptions at the start of the year. So they might have just charged 3% on 30 for 12 months of the year. Again, it's a change of its times. Probably, again, he's asked that. He's not likely to ask anything massive on it again, uh, but no liability from any of my statements. Question four. Question four, guidance. Requirement A, extremely straightforward. Six marks for general discussion and unforgivable if we don't get nearly six marks here. So in requirement A, he's saying, if you have a choice of policy, so why choose a particular policy? And possibly, of course, companies change policies, as you know. Secondly, thinking again about how that all links up with faithful representation. And finally, comparability. I suspect we could all get a couple of marks by saying why they choose a particular policy. Of course, it might be that they're choosing the one that is most faithful, or maybe again, they are seeking again to maximize profit for something like profit related pay or something like that. So again, so again, so again, I'd say that the directors sometimes may have selfish intentions FIFO in stock valuation or inventory valuation gives you higher profit than average if prices are going up maybe they want a higher profit faithful representation just put down the definition and then def you know apply it a bit Faithful representation, remember, it means the information must be complete, neutral, and free from error. And finally, in trying to discuss comparability, remember, 
Comparability is achieved in two ways. You have to think about comparability to the prior year in the same company. And of course, if they change policy, you will get comparability because they'll do a prior period adjustment. And secondly, comparability to other companies. If two retailers of clothing have got similar business models, but one thinks FIFO is right, one thinks the average cost is right, then you won't get comparability. That's just the way it is. Requirement B is in two parts. The first thing that we're asked to do, probably for three marks, is explain return on equity and its component parts. So we've got return on equity. You're told the return on equity is a multiple of profit margin, then sales over assets, so that's asset turnover. And then finally, assets over equity. It's a sort of measure of gearing. It tells you how much of the assets are financed by equity, again, as opposed to debt. So it's a sort of measure of gearing. Once you've got that, again, actually to explain these would be okay, wouldn't it? Return on equity is the rate of return to investors. Margin is about the profitability of sales. Asset turnover is about the efficiency of use of assets. And this final ratio, assets over equity, so how many much of the assets is financed by assets, by equity as opposed to debt. Again, you can see again, so obviously again, it tells you about the proportion of the business that is debt as opposed to equity. In this case, again, the way it works out, it's strictly showing us about the proportion financed by equity. In addition, in part one, they also asked us to calculate using the information in table one. So that would need some calculations, which again, you can see in the answer. To be honest, those cannot possibly go wrong because you've got the information there. So all you're doing is using those figures in table one to get your uh, calculation out. Again, so I would say there are two easy marks for the calculations. I think the danger is that you misread the question and then perhaps don't use table one, in which case, you'll very much make a rod for your own back and do something that's not asked for. That's the first requirement. The second requirement is to look at some transactions the directors have posted and try and explain how they've impacted on the figures and on the ratios. With those transactions, of course, again, make sure you get down any accounting knowledge. So in terms of the transactions, they talk about the special purpose entity. That takes you back to subsidiaries. It takes you back to the definition of control. And the point is that if you take assets off the balance sheet, you know, wherever you put them, whether you put them in a company or not, it sounds to me like they've set up a company, then they still ought to come back in in some form 
if you have control of them. So I, in terms of knowledge, you will find in the arts there will be some sort of definition of control. In addition, however you want to, again, so you want to refer to it, this building should be consolidated. So at the end of the day, it should be consolidated. It should be included in the balance sheet. What the directors have done is actually wrong. If they consolidate the building, then what's going to go up is the assets. If the assets go up, then, for example, the asset turnover will go down. So there's something about the special purpose entity. You've then got the share buyback. And even if you can't do anything sophisticated, we could still explain the basic double entry. So if you buy back shares, the assets of the business will fall. And also, of course, share capital and reserves would fall. So equity will fall as well. If that's all you can say, it's something. We've then got the issue of debt. So in addition, we've got the issue of the loan capital. When the loan is actually issued, of course, that would cause the assets to increase. The double entry is debit, asset, cash, credit, loan, liability. None of this ratio is bringing liabilities in. We're not asked about the impact on net assets, but just assets. So the only thing that would change in those calculations is the assets would get greater. And finally, maybe you're saying something about the associate. You'd be struggling and you'd be very tired at this stage in the exam but by using the equity accounting so in terms of using the equity accounting bringing in the share of profits that would of course increase the profit and again the equity after you've done that if you had time He's then saying, if you're looking at the printed answer, that how would this business have been if we reversed those transactions, if we corrected the first one, which was an error, reversed the others to get comparability of like on like. And clearly, it would give you different results. In part A, if you did the count in part one, if you'd done the calculation properly, um, return on equity, I think, was a change from 39 to 17, or no, 17 to 39 percent. If those transactions had not been there, the position would have been different. So he was hoping that you'd do some calculations there as well. That's the end of this debrief.